Over the last several years, I've typically taken this Sunday to preach on the subject of money. Because I, the truth is that through the rest of the year, I, I typically am not preaching on that. Um, I'll just tell you right off, my sermon this morning is entitled, Ten Myths Concerning Money and Giving. Who has a good uh, definition of what a myth is? What is a myth? What was that? Something that people believe that can't be proven. That's actually false. Right. A myth is something that is false. It not only can't be proven, it can't be proven because it isn't true. That which is true can never be proven. Because if it could be proven, it would be true, right? Well, are you ready for these? I want to go... You know, I, I have hit on ten things that I believe, and we're going we're gonna to have assorted verses. I don't have a verse for you to turn to right here, but all, I mean, I just, I have lots of verses. In fact, you may not want to even try to turn to all of them, because I want to shoot through some of them uh, just for effect. I want to move through some of these quick. I mean, this is, that what I'm going to do today is largely, in some ways, just, it's a Bible study, um, maybe even more than um, just a sermon where I'm actually going to be preaching. Um, you can jot these down, you can try to look at them, but you're just not going to be able to keep up with me. Um, so I have ten myths. The first myth is this, and what I want to ask you as I'm going through these is, you know, the first thing to, to think about is, do you fall into this? Is, is there any possibility that, that this myth is something that you have found true in your own life? Myth number one is this. Talking about money is basically unspiritual. And uh, now, now look, you, you got to... We know the environment we live in today. The truth is, we know the spiritual climate we live in today. Mark, where, where are you at, Mark? Mark Outing? I guess there's a bunch of Marks here. Mark, Mark told me that literally, the church that he came from before he came here talked about money in every service. No matter what the subject was, eventually... You know, it's like I, I think I heard John Piper say one time, he talked about some of these fundamentalist churches that uh, somebody was talking about the fact that they always would talk about baptism, and you know, they'd be preaching from Genesis and now a word about baptism. They'd throw that in at the end. Well, that's, that's what a lot of the churches today, you can't sit in any service without hearing about money. And in fact, Mark, if I, if I remember right, it was Mark that told me that he would actually sit in services where they pass the plate, they take the plate to the front, and the elders would say, not enough, pass it again. Wasn't that you, brother? I mean, come on. That's... Hey, you can see how he'd respond. I don't want to have a plate for offerings ever even enter the doors of this church. Because I don't, I don't want to try... We came to the east side not to get their money. We came to be winners of souls, did we not? And I don't want to have people come in here and slam a plate under their nose and think that they have to give and twist their arm. Try. You know what I have found in Scripture is when God saves people, they become like those Macedonians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where you, you don't have to twist their arm to give. They're twisting your arm to take your money. And that, if you don't know about the Macedonians, that's what they were doing. Paul, Paul saw them in their extreme poverty, and he, said, he was basically saying no. And they're pleading with them to be able to give to the saints that were in dire need there in Jerusalem. That's what the gospel does to people. That's what being born again does. We don't have to coerce people. And 11 years of this church's history has proven that. That God moves on the hearts of His people. And so we've never had to do that. But... Um, now, I think 
This was, I think Freddie was in a meeting, but I think also maybe Carlos's dad. They sat in a meeting one time where they came out with a five-gallon bucket, dropped it down in front of the church, and locked all the doors and said, nobody's leaving here until they fill that up. That was your dad, right? His dad got so turned off by that. You know what? I'd get turned off by that. If somebody did that in a service, I would, I would tell them, you let me out of here right now. I'm calling 911. <laughs> I mean, that's... that's Folks, okay, okay, and yesterday I heard this story. I was looking for stories because I thought these folks that came over yesterday might have some good ones for me. They had one that was really good. Basically, in their church, this young man convinced through his blog, convinced, basically did a convincing article that there was no curse attached to people if you did not tithe. Well, the pastor, the bishop, rather, stood up the next day, and he said, well, that's true, there is no curse for those who don't tithe, but Jesus told Peter that whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and so that bishop bound it right there. If you don't tithe, you're cursed. So even though the Bible doesn't teach it, I have the authority to curse you. Yeah, that is bold, folks. That is bold. And you know, there was, a, there was a woman that we were ministering to back when we first came here. Some of you might remember her, but she came here and she visited a church that meets up commerce here. And she told us that when she was in the service, the pastor's wife jumped in the pulpit one time while they were doing it. That's a problem in the first place. But as they were... <laughs> as they were doing the collection there, and she's just, she's waxing eloquent and telling them, we don't want your 10s and 20s, we want your 50s and 100s. Brethren, this stuff is happening, the bishop deal happening right up the street here, the, other, the deal Mark was talking about, right up the street over there, this lady right up the street here. Brethren, this is happening all around us. And those of us that go way back, we remember when the church on the move invited us over there and tried to tried to basically take the money from the brethren here. The truth is, we live in the TBN area, right? You guys ever seen that Michael Murdoch guy? I mean, all you got to do is watch him for a moment, and you're like, I mean, if that's, if that's representative of Christianity, and that's what some people see, we live with so much coercion and manipulation, extortion, con men, shysters, scandals. It's all around us. All these ungodly appeals for money, and it is shamelessly done in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, those men in that day, whoa, 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 we heard that. That, that is going to be their... The truth is, we tend to get suspicious. But you know what can happen? We can become like the proverbial pendulum and we swing all the, way, all the way the other way. You know, I remember when I was first saved, I could not get enough of John MacArthur came on the radio at 7.30 every day and I was there. I was, I was tuning in and I can remember shortly after I was saved, oh, I was so excited, ready for this. I ran in 7.30. Here comes grace to you. This was it. I was going to feast. We're starting a new series on money and finances. And it was like, what? Not that. I mean, I, I want something on the, the nature of true repentance, lordship, salvation, give me the deity of Christ. Not money. And see, I felt that way in the beginning. But you know what? I listened to that series and what I realized, I needed it. My, my ideas about money and my ideas about giving were so wrong and they were so off and they were so shallow. I needed that help. I mean, but, you know, on the one hand, we find things. Like if you've got the old King James Version, you know it talks about filthy lucre. Ever read that? I mean, you have that First Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And then there in Luke 16.9, we've got this parable, I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth. And so you go to the Bible, and it's true, it speaks about it, unrighteous wealth, filthy lucre. You see all this trouble attached to it. But that, look, the wealth itself might have those characteristics, but certainly talking about it is not an unspiritual thing. I mean, the, the truth is that money and what men do with money 
says so much about where their heart is. And Jesus spoke about this much, and as well as did Paul. The, idea, the money and wealth came up a lot because it, it... Here's the thing about money. It is the embodiment of all that man can do. People don't want, any, want money for the sake of money. They want money for the sake of what money can buy. And what can money buy? Money can buy all that man can give. You see the difference? You can't serve God in money. What God can give and what God has to offer over against what man can give and what man has to offer, which is embodied by money. It really is. That is a, just saying money is an easy way to basically snowball all that man can do. And so, this reality... I mean, brethren, this reality, it's, it's clear to me, as I hope it is to you, that when you get into the Gospels and when you start to look at what Jesus had to teach on, He did not find talking about money to be an unspiritual thing. Now, He might have said many things about unspiritual uses of money, but talking about it and teaching on it in a biblical fashion is not an unspiritual thing to do. In fact, it is very revealing. And there's much that we can learn. And... The thing is, he never hesitated to talk about it. And I tell you, if we're brave enough to look at what he said, we might need to be prepared to be surprised and even uncomfortable, challenged, convicted, maybe even agitated. See, we don't typically like to admit that we get agitated with Jesus. Typically you want to say, I'm agitated with the preacher. You don't want to admit that it's actually Christ. But Christ had some things to say about money that are pretty agitating. And so, if we're brave enough, and, and brethren, I'll tell you, if you just, I, I can, Ruby just told me, she was reminding me today about some of the Reformed churches out there that actually, the elders want to sit down with the people in the church and go through their checkbook, and uh, brethren, I think, I, think that's, uh, I think that's lording it over people. But could you imagine sitting down with Jesus Christ Himself? Just, just based on what he taught, take what he taught and sit down with Christ. I don't think he would say this is an unspiritual conversation. I think he would find it very spiritual, and you would too. If you sat down with your checkbook, with your budget, with your credit card statement, all opened up before him, you and him sat down across from each other, would you be comfortable? I really believe that if Jesus Christ came into this church he would make us feel uncomfortable. Don't you get that idea? The kind of life that he called us to live and the things he said about money and the fact that we live in one of the richest countries. I mean, I know there are countries that have per person their, their higher, uh, higher average salaries. But the United States of America, we live in one of the richest countries ever in all the history of mankind. We have so much around us and we we live in a country that loves money, and they love all that it can buy, and they go after it. We are a money-hungry country. We live in the midst of it. We're like fish. We don't even know we're wet half the time, just be simply because we live in this environment of such greed and covetousness all around us, and we, we can really buy into it. Jesus sits down across from us and he has us open all this up. And brethren, you know the kind of things he said. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasure here. Do not lay up treasure here. You say, well, I, Lord, I have a bank account over here. I have a checking account. I have a retirement fund. I have these things. Do not lay up for yourself. Well, Lord, isn't there a place for laying up a little? I mean, if I want to buy... If I want to buy something tomorrow, should I keep some money here? And what happens is we, we really want to take Jesus' words and we want to come up with all the exceptions. But the truth is, Jesus laid it down. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures here. Don't lay them up. Don't lay them up. And why not? Because the thing is, if you lay them up here, you don't get the eternal reward from them. And the problem is, if you lay them up here, you have things like rust and thieves Economic collapse. I can remember one missionary uh, talking about the fact that wouldn't it be glorious if we could say that when, when the stock market has crashed various times, no Christian was ever hurt by it because his investment was where it couldn't be touched by financial disaster. 
you know what? Jesus, Jesus had one guy come to him one day and he said, um, I want to follow you. Jesus didn't come around and say, well, I'm going to be unspiritual here and I'm going to talk to you about my possessions. He hit him with a very spiritual reality. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And you know what? You say, well, that was just, that was to him. That doesn't mean that we can't have stuff. Well, listen, there was another occasion somebody came to him, or he didn't, they didn't come to him, he went to them. It was a tax collector, and he said, follow me. And that man got up and left his whole tax collecting Matthew, left it all behind. There was, there was another occasion, folks, where Jesus goes to a rich young ruler. He says, sell it all. You say, yeah, but he knew what his idol was. Brethren, I'm telling you, in this country, money is an idol to more of us than we are willing to admit. And he said, you go sell it all, you'll have treasure in heaven, and you come follow me. We, brethren, he said, unless you forsake all that you have, you can't be my disciple. And when he comes into the life, he takes control of the money. And what he's telling you is, if you're going to stockpile money here, if you're going to save up money for any reason, you better be able to do it with some kind of biblical conviction after you get a statement that he says, don't lay it up. Don't do that. Don't act that way with regards to your money. He comes and he says other crazy things. You cannot serve God in money. Well, what's that look like? What does it mean if I'm serving money? Is this, is this, is this unspiritual talk? It's not unspiritual at all. It hits right at the heart. You can't serve God in money. Listen to what he says right after that. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. See, who you serve tells me about your anxieties. Guess what? If you invest in the stock market, you get anxious about how the stock market's doing, right? You'll be anxious. You will be living anxiously. But if you store up money there, you see, it's, it's really unbelief. So much of this is unbelief. Now look, it's not unbelief to say, my car is getting on its last leg, and I'm going to buy another used vehicle, four years old. I'm going to, I'm going to be really wise here. Um, I'm going to try to get the most car for the least amount of money, and I realize I'm probably looking at seven or $8,000, and since I don't make seven or $8,000 every paycheck, there is a place to wisely be ready. You know, that's one. Jesus had a bag, right? They had a bag in, with their disciples. They had a money bag. What is a money bag? A money bag is a place to put money so that when you need the money, you can take it out. I mean, th there's a place for a bank account to put money in so that when you need it, you can take it out. But you know what laying up is. Laying up is when you are putting money out there and you are stockpiling it and you are storing it and you are trusting it. You're serving it. You're living for it. And your anxieties hinge on it. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. You ask yourself, do you spend more time thinking about money than about God and serving Him? Seek First, the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. We spend lots of time worrying about money. And he says, don't worry about money. Brethren, this is a very spiritual subject. Very spiritual. It is not ungodly. It is not unspiritual. But you see, Jesus wasn't like Benny Hinn. He was not standing out there talk, crying out to all the people and how badly he needed their money. That's not the kind of talk we're talking. That kind is unspiritual. We're talking about the kind of talk about money that shows where your heart is, what you're devoted to, what you're giving your life for, what you love. And we live in a country of lovers of money. And it, brethren, what happens is we so live in that environment of commercials and we have to have to be satisfied and more money is going to make us happy and all this and we're hit by it. We're hit by the... the I mean, John Piper, he talks about the fact that he, he believes we live in a Disneyland. It's not real here. And people just living for, for retirement and we got so many people storing up all this retirement, all this savings, all this for tomorrow. It's a safety net. And what are you trusting? Are you trusting the God who said that He's going to, say, he's going to provide for all of our needs? Go, and we could go on with this. And, and you know what? When, when, he, 
When Jesus is teaching on this, you know what he said? He looked at rich people and he looked at his disciples after one of these rich people walked away because he wanted his riches more than he wanted eternal life. And Jesus looks to his disciples and he says, you, you know what he said. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Take that to heart. Here's myth number two. I am not rich. Let me tell you something. Most of the world lives hand to mouth. In other words, they work today and they eat today. If they don't work today, they don't eat today. Average salary in Egypt, where Kevin and I just were, from $100 to $400 a month. A farmer in Assam, where John Seitzma labors in northeast India, $43 per month. In the Yunnan province of China, where we support missionaries, the average monthly salary, $387. Trevor Johnson is in Papua, Indonesia, average salary, $50 per month or less. Brethren, we live in Disneyland. This is a make-believe world. Most of us do not live that way. We have so much, even you single guys, you know it. You can get a job here where you have free money to go buy a pair of tennis shoes anytime you want to. And I'll tell you, there's a day coming when Jesus Christ is going to reckon with us for how we've spent the money. And he says, it is easier for the camel somehow to get crammed through a little eye of a needle than for us to make it to heaven. And you know what? Judgment Day is going to prove it true. There are people in here, you are stockpiling money and you are laying up money and you are anxious all the time and your heart is not in the right place because you're serving money. And look, when Jesus says you can't serve God in money, He wasn't messing around. You're going to find that the things that Jesus said are going to prove true in the end. See, we like to say, we like to be pragmatic and we like to say, yeah, but I know people who are laying up a lot of money and they, they seem to be Christians and they, but they seem to love money at the same time. See, we, we like to look at these things and say, well, he's a Christian and that's true of him when Jesus is saying, no, if that's true of him, he's not a Christian. You see, we take it backwards so often. But brethren, Jesus, Said, when he said, I don't have any place to lay my head, when he's telling people to follow him, when he's saying that, when he's telling these people to sell everything, brethren, you don't want to look at that and say, well, that has no implication on me and middle class American life today because after all, we live where we live. We live in the communities. We, we live in the country of gated communities and swimming pools and, and all this kind of stuff. Brethren, we want to be very careful. We want to be very careful lest we say, well, he's going to understand. Certainly he's going to understand because I have a family and I want them to be safe and I, I want to have a car that doesn't break down. Brethren, we need to be very careful. Listen to what he says. He's saying, I don't have a place to lay my head and he calls us to follow him. Am I saying it, it's sin to have a home? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, brethren, we live in an environment where we better be very careful. We live in a rich and a wealthy place. And it is hard for rich people to get there. And if you think you're not... See, if you think you're not rich, what you're doing, I know what you're doing. You're comparing yourself to other Americans. But all you have to do is go over there to northeast India or go to where Trevor is in Papua, Indonesia, and you're going to find out very quickly you are extremely wealthy and they all look at you that way. They look at you as though you're made of gold. And you know the truth is, you can't look at them and say you're not. You are. You have potential here in this country to make amounts of money those people can't even imagine. We are rich, folks, and rich people are very hard to be saved. So, myth number one, talking about money is unspiritual. No, no, it's not. Jesus talked about it a lot. Myth number two, we're not rich. That's a myth. We are rich. I mean, in light of the last 2,000 years, folks, our country is just so wealthy. It, it is amazing. Myth number three. Now, this is a subtle one, but we have to watch it because... Because we can really be tempted with this one. Myth number three, God needs my money. And you say, well, maybe, maybe you don't feel like you think that way. But, you know, we can read things in Scripture. 
Just, just like this, will a man rob God? You know, many of you know this, Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and offerings, or tithes and contributions. You're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me. The whole nation of you. I mean, verses like that, they can tend to give us... Look, we have a natural human disposition of works as it is. And you know what a works mindset is? That we're able to give to God. That He needs what we have to give Him. There are people, they work for God and they say, you know, I've done all this for God as though He needs them to do all that. And now I expect this and that. And people, people have this mindset that God somehow needs our money. But let me just correct that and do it with effect. God Himself comes along and in Haggai 2.8, you, some of you may know this, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And let me tell you, <clears throat> there was a day when David is standing out there before the Lord and the people of Israel around. And you know what happened? God had told him through the prophet, that not you will build the temple, but your son will. But you know what? Even though it will be your son, David was given the opportunity to raise the money, to give contributions towards that temple that would be built by his son. And he called upon Israel to give that as well. And after all these offerings came in, after the people gave of their resources, David comes out and he says, <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. We're strangers before you, sojourners as all of our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O oh Lord our God, <clears throat> all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. You say, well, if he doesn't need it, then why would he have us even give? Couldn't God get around having us give? If it's all His, why does He need us to give? Now listen to this. Here's the reason God wants our money. David goes on to say, I know my God that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people, and direct their hearts toward you. You see, it's a test of where the heart is directed. Do you know in the text that is so often quoted, Malachi 3, 8, and 9, what is it that God was truly being robbed of? Was He being so much robbed of the tithes and offerings? Or is it rather this? He says... Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Why? Because I need it? No. Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. You see what God is truly being robbed of? 
being trusted. That's where the robbery is. You see why God would have us give? Because it's a test of our heart. It's a test of who we love. It's a test of who we serve. And what God was really being robbed of is people putting Him to the test. Have you ever noticed God loves to be put to the test? Not in a provoking fashion. Not in a presumptuous fashion. But in a way that says, I believe your promises. And I'll tell you this, it is never presumptuous to believe God's promises. If God has said it, you can bank on it, folks. And it is never presumption. It is faith. Oh, brethren. God does not need our money. Have you ever heard? I I love this account. I love this account because it speaks to me. 2 Chronicles 25.5 Amaziah assembled the men of Judah and he set them by father's houses under commanders. What he did, and he found that there was 300,000 choice men fit for war. But you know what? He felt like he needed more. So you know what he did? This was a king of Judah. He went and hired 100,000 men from Israel. That's when the kingdom was split. Well, Israel, Ephraim, they were not following God. And God sends the prophet. A man of God came to him and said, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you. For the Lord is not with them, with these Ephraimites. But go, act, be strong for the battle. Why should you suppose that God will cast you down before the enemy? For God has power to help or cast down. In other words, trust Him. You don't need those 100,000 men. Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do about the hundred talents of gold that I have given to the army of Israel? The man of God answered, The Lord is able to give you much more than that. And brethren, Not only does God not need our money, His purposes for us don't revolve around how much money I have or don't have. It's a little matter to Him. And brethren, when you get in certain places, you think, well, I have to be a good steward and I have to do this. And Brethren, I'm telling you, if you get in a situation to do right is going to cost you money, don't let money be the issue. God is more than able to provide it. God is never, His arm is not shortened. His arm is not crippled. His arm is not broken to help His people. You do what's right. You concern yourself with what's right. You say, yeah, but if I, if I store up, if I really did some of these radical things like you say, and I really took you seriously, and I really didn't store up treasure here on this earth, what's going to happen to my family when I get to a place that, look, you, get, you can lose... You can lose a hundred talents of gold or even better, invest it in heaven. And is God not able to give you much more than that? Is God able to take care of my wife and my children if I die and I don't have retirement? You say, that's presumptuous. Well, maybe, or maybe it's faith. Maybe it's faith in a promise that says that if I lay up treasure right now, that it goes to heaven And that God has given me promises that says He'll supply all my need. And that if I give, it will be given to me, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. Will men give it? Brethren, a lot of times the the problem isn't that we're being presumptuous. The problem is we're not really hearing His promises. Because I have never known the righteous to be begging bread. I have never known people that have given to end up in situations where they're in trouble. Brethren, myth number three, God needs our money. He does not need your money. He does not need your money at all. He needs your heart. And what you do with your money tests it. The tithe is so important back there in Malachi 3, not because God needed the money and they were robbing Him in that fashion. It was because they weren't putting Him to the test. And testing what? Testing His faithfulness. Myth number four, if I had more money, I'd be happier. Now, brethren, you say, if I got a check for $1,000 in the mail tomorrow, I, that would make me happy. Would any of you say that? Come on, Jonathan, you'd say that. So would I. I'd say that. It helped me pay off my house faster. You guys are all in suspense, like, oh, if we say yes and we tell the truth, he's going to say we're unspiritual. But here's the thing. I mean, let's talk truth here. The world flashes its bumper stickers that say, he that dies with the most toys wins. Is that what the Bible says? 
The Bible says that riches don't deliver in the day of wrath. You think you win if you have the most toys? And you go to hell? Does that sound like winning? You see, the, folks, the thing is, if I got a check for $5,000 in the, in the mail tomorrow, I would be happy because I'm trying to pay off my house. And, and that would make me happy to be able to do that. But you know what? A week later, I'm not still, my soul is not able to feast on that. See, it doesn't, the, the, the riches here, the money here, it's so temporary in the pleasures that it brings. And the, and the thing is, you know, when you get some, yeah, it might make me immediately happy, just like the guy who gets a raise. I mean, guys, you got a raise. So, some of, how many of you have ever gotten a raise at work? It made you happy when you got it, right? But if 15 years go by and that was the last raise you got, are you still as happy 15 years later as you were the day 15 years before when you got the raise? No. If you didn't get a raise since then, you're angry. Why? I mean, how, why didn't, wasn't that happiness abiding? Well, brethren, we know what the Scripture says about this. Sheol and Abaddon, Proverbs 27, 20, are never satisfied. And never satisfied are the eyes of man. Because, what, because money can't satisfy. It doesn't hit us at the point of our satisfaction uh, producer, right? It doesn't reach into the heart. It doesn't. Ecclesiastes 2.10 Whatever my eyes desired, this is Solomon speaking, whatever my eyes desired, in other words, all that money could buy, I did not keep from my desires. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Then I considered and beheld all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Or Ecclesiastes 5.10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Or how about Psalm 52, 7? See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. You see what? There's destruction for the person that trusts in money. The person that's looking for happiness in money might get a little bit, and it might be temporary, and it's like all sin, right? The pleasures in this world, they're for a season. The problem with it is, hell lies at the end for the person who gives himself to money. And so even if it gives you a little satisfaction and gratification, and even if it purchases a little bit of what man can offer, and you, that new car makes you feel good for a day, the problem is, 100,000 years from now, that new car doesn't make you feel good as you are suffering for your sins and the smoke of your torment goes up forever and ever. You see, the problem is, no matter what money can do here, judgment is coming. That's the reality, folks. We, we can say, if I had more money, I'd be happier. Yeah, but what kind of happiness are you looking for? That's the thing. Remember Hamor and Shechem? Those were those two Hivites. And here comes Jacob and all of his children. And they, he sees uh, Dinah, his daughter. And remember, um, this, this guy, uh, Hamor, or was it, Hamor was the father, Shechem was the son. But anyway, they're... Uh, they say, hey, will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours if we go and have our men circumcised and they're able to take this daughter to themselves? But you know what happened? The sons of Jacob went and butchered them all. They were dead. Judas, did his riches satisfy him very long? Boy, he got those. It wasn't long. He was tossing those on the ground. And then his, he hung himself and his bowels spilled out. And Gehazi, you remember the servant of, of uh, Elisha? He saw Naaman, the leper. He came, and he came with all this riches. And Elisha said, I don't want any of your money. Well, as they were leaving, Gehazi said, ran after him and said, you know what, my master changed his mind. Well, his master hadn't changed his mind. He was lying. He was greedy. He wanted some of this stuff. And what happened to him? Did he end up happy? He ended up with leprosy. Not happy. Demas. You think Demas is happy right now? He abandoned the gospel for the sake of this world? All the stuff it's got to offer, you think he's happy? Did that bring him happiness? Balaam, you guys think Balaam's happy? He was ready to sell Israel and curse them for the money Balak and the honor that he had to give him. 
His dead body laid out there with the rest of the Moabites after that day, folks. You think, he, you think he's happy? Brethren, the people that have gone after it are not happy. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain, Proverbs 15, 27 says, he troubles his own house. You go after money, you live for money, you give your life for money, you love money, it will inevitably lead to neglect and lack of love in your family and causing trouble there. You think it brings happiness to families? It doesn't. You know who, you know who the people are in this country that have the highest suicide rate? Look at how much money they make. As the money goes up, the suicide rate goes up. Brethren, it doesn't bring the kind of fulfilling happiness. In fact, if you look at rich people, you know who the most gratified are? Not the ones who inherited it, the ones who had to work for it. Those that inherited it are far more miserable. Because they didn't work. There's something about work that may, brings more gratification than the money itself. Proverbs 23, 4, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. What? What should I discern? I should discern that toiling to acquire wealth, you know, Proverbs is a book of wisdom, is it not? I mean, wisdom has to do with what? Wisdom has to do, remember our brother came here and said, wisdom has to do with the anticipation of consequences. Wisdom has to do with looking down the path and seeing where is this path I'm on going to lead me? You know what? A person who's wise desists in trying to acquire a bunch of wealth. Why? Because if you're wise, you look ahead and you see it really doesn't satisfy. If I have the, the wherewithal to make money, it shouldn't be to acquire wealth. You, did, you heard that part, right? We should be able to work with our hands so that we have something to give to those that are in need. That's what it says in Ephesians. But it's acquiring the wealth. Brethren, it's again, it's that storehouse mentality. Those who would take money and not be rich towards God and pack their barns with it are in trouble. And rich people, through the eye of a needle, you want to drag a camel. I just was in Egypt. I rose, rode a camel. If you'd have told me, get that camel through the eye of a needle, I'd have told you I'm going to have to do some severe destruction to this thing. It would not fit, folks. Look, when Jesus talked that way, it shocked his disciples. And it ought to shock us too. We, it ought to have the same shock effect. Are we living as redeemed people and followers of the one who had no place to lay his head? Are we living to his word? Are we as rich people being rich in good works and laying up a bountiful store in heaven? Brethren, this is reality. And storing it up here does not produce happiness. 1 Timothy 6, 9. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And if you think you're impervious to that, you can play with this greed of this world and that it won't suck you into that same kind of destruction. Brethren, I don't find anything in that verse that says you've got happiness at the end. It doesn't sound happy. Or how about James 5? Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. You see the same thing again, laying up treasure, acquiring wealth. Building stockpiles, laying up for yourself here on the earth. Brethren, scriptures don't speak highly of that. And people that do that better watch out. Because Jesus' words to the rich are serious, they are severe, they are uncomfortable, and I'm not saying them. All you have to do is sit down and study them to come to this reality. Brethren, happiness is never promised in money. God never, ever promises it there. Where does He promise joy? In His presence, He promises joy. He promises that there is joy in salvation. Joy. What does He tell His disciples? Rejoice because your name is written where? In heaven. Oh, brethren, you know what? If that's true 15 years ago, that feeds me today. I don't need a raise on that one. That's still good today, 15 years later. I'm still living on that one. There's joy. Joy. There's joy with regards to money. But it's not on the receiving end. Blessed are those that give, right? More than those that receive. Brethren, there's joy in God's loving kindness. Joy in God's love. You know, that proverb 11.4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath. That's a big one. That's a big one right there. 
Riches don't, you, you just think of where you're headed, folks, and you get to judgment day, and a stockpile acquiring wealth, laying up a bunch of wealth on this, way, it's not going to help you in that day. Our, we are told to greatly rejoice in the, in the Lord. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, rejoice, and exult not in your money, but with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Now that is worth rejoicing. When there is no judgment of God and His law against me anymore, I am free, I am forgiven. What Christ did on the cross is mine, and there is no condemnation. That is worth rejoicing about. Not in money, folks. I mean, you get, you get these proverbial comparisons. Remember, Proverbs. Look at the consequences at the end of the road, the anticipation of consequences. It is amazing to me how often in Proverbs you get this. Proverbs 8, verse 10. We are to seek instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. Wisdom is better than jewels. Proverbs 8, 19. Wisdom's fruit is better than gold, even fine gold. Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Proverbs 16, 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Proverbs 19, 1. Better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. Proverbs 19, 22. A poor man is better than a liar. Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Proverbs 28, 6, Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. I'll tell you what, the Proverbs are full of this kind of thing. You don't want to seek money for your happiness. There's all sorts of things in life that are better than money. All sorts of things. The things that really matter. Okay, very Quickly, I need to move ahead, I know. Myth number five. My giving says little about my spirituality. I know sometimes we get young people here and it's like, well, my spirituality is basically to be measured by how much I go out on the street and evangelize or my spirituality is basically on how much scripture I've memorized or if, if I've found the superior Bible translation or if I've found the superior works of the superior Puritan or something. That, that, that somehow, brethren... Your giving says a lot about your spirituality. Let me tell you this. Deacons, you think they're supposed to be spiritual men in the church? Absolutely. They're supposed to be blameless, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, clearly head and shoulders above the rest. They must not be greedy for dishonest gain. That's part of being blameless. You talk about spiritual level, it is judged by these characteristics found in the officers of the church. You have deacons there. How about elders? Clearly men that must be of the utmost spirituality, blameless, respectable. And what does it say? Not a lover of money. How about this? That priceless woman from Proverbs 31, the excellent wife who is far more precious than jewels. Listen to what's said of her. Proverbs 31.20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Men, the way a woman gives has everything to do with what she is. You know, a little bit, a few verses later, it says something about outward beauty, being vain, about her charm, not being so important, folks. Look, look at how a woman gives. These, these are tests of where a person's spirituality is. How about this? Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Okay, you want to talk about spirituality? You think it's more spiritual to be living a life that's pleasing to God versus one that is less pleasing to God? Absolutely. Isn't that the measure of spirituality? To be pleasing to God. What's pleasing to God? That you do good, you share what you have. With such sacrifices, He's pleased. How about Matthew 19, 21? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect! To who? That rich young ruler. Isn't that amazing? A standard of perfection according to Jesus is selling all that you have and giving to the poor. Pretty amazing. Isaiah 58. 
the fast that God desires, true spirituality, what does that look like? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? That all requires giving, folks. That all requires financial commitment. When you see the naked to cover him, that costs money. And these are the people that it says their light breaks forth like the dawn, their healing springs up speedily, righteousness shall go before them, the glory of the Lord be their rear guard, they're the people that call, the Lord will answer. You don't think there isn't anything spiritual about this? This is the spiritual person. It goes on to say, if you yourself, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, that means giving your money to give them food, satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Your light will rise, the darkness and gloom be as noonday, and on it goes. How about Jeremiah twenty two sixteen? He talks about the king who judged the cause of the poor and needy. He was concerned about their needs. And it listen, Jeremiah says, then it was well. God says this is not this to know me, declares the Lord. This is the standard of what it is to know Him. This is the standard of the fast that He desires. This is the standard of perfection according to Jesus. This is the standard of pleasing God according to Hebrews. How about James 127? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And I don't know how you visit them in their affliction unless you're given to them. That's the standard of religion that's pure and undefiled. How about this? Matthew 25, 34, you know it. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. What's the standard of those who are blessed by my Father? Again, they're giving to the hungry. They're giving to the thirsty. They're going and visiting people in their need. It's giving. The one Here's a man who's called blameless. His name is Job. Want to know a standard of blamelessness? Here's Job. If I have withheld anything, the poor desire to have caused the eyes of the widow to fail or have eaten my morsel alone. Fatherless has not eaten of it with me. For from my youth, the fatherless grew up with me as a father. And from my mother's womb, I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or needy without covering. Again, you have a, you have a man that's, this, this is a man that's called blameless. Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it's a standard of where your heart is. Luke 16, 8, the sons of this world are more shrewd. The sons of this world are more shrewd than the sons of light in dealing with their own generation. And this has to do with what they do with their money. If you look at that overall problem. I mean, basically, it's a standard of shrewdness. It's a standard of blamelessness. It's a standard of where your heart is. It's a standard of what pleases the Lord. It's a standard of the fast that God requires. It's a standard of perfection. It's a standard of all these things, folks. It's a standard of those who are blessed of the Father on the day of judgment. You don't think that your giving doesn't have anything to do with where your spirituality is? It certainly does. It absolutely does. Number six, myth number six, God will make you monetarily rich in this world if you give. That is a myth. Folks, I, I have various here, but I think it would suffice to say that God chooses the poor of this world. James tells us that. We find those Macedonians who were so liberal, they were in extreme poverty. With all their giving to the, to the saints, you don't find that their extreme poverty was necessarily delivered. You could say, well, after they gave, it happened. Well, I don't know, Paul was a pretty giving guy, and he says, well, basically, sum up my life, here's, here's what I've got. I'm in great labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. Frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in city, danger in wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. That sounds like he didn't have food, he didn't have clothes, he didn't have a place to lay his head, which by the way sounds like somebody else, like maybe the master. Didn't Je Jesus was the most giving that ever has come along and wore human flesh. And do you think he came here and found great riches? He didn't have any place to lay his head. Brethren, there is no promise from God. Despite all that these health, wealth, prosperity guys are saying, it is lie, it is a myth, it isn't true, and it can't be proven from Scripture. In fact, 
oftentimes, the more faithfully you serve Christ, the more you're going to be persecuted, the more you're going to lose. You remember those Hebrews we've been talking about? When they identified with those that were put into into prison for the gospel, what happened? Their goods got pilfered. They didn't get added to. They visited these guys in prison, no doubt, took them, used their financial resources, took them money, helped them, furnished them. And a lot of folks in a lot of those Middle Eastern jails, if you didn't have somebody come and bring you supplying your food, it's often that way today as well. You don't eat. They were, they were providing. Brethren, it's a myth. It's a myth that God's going to make you rich here. But if you're faithful to Him and you're a person that walks from faith to faith, trusting in Jesus Christ, a life of faith that shows itself in love, like all those people you see there gathered in Matthew 25 on Judgment Day, brethren, He's going to make you rich in the kingdom that comes in ways that are we can't even hardly touch on. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Yes, there is treasure to be laid up there. Luke 12, 33, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with what? Money bags that do not grow old. There is an eternal reward coming for those. Treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Luke 16, 9 talks about those who receive you into eternal dwellings. Give your money so that you get received into those dwellings. We're told in James 2, 5, heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who loved Him. 1 Peter 1, 4, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Ephesians 1, 18, what are the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints? Folks, there, there, God is going to make His people unbelievably wealthy. But not in this world. There's no promise for this world. But, myth number seven, my financial problems have nothing to do with my giving. This is sort of the opposite of the last myth, but it doesn't undo the last one. There's no promises from God that He's going to make you rich in this world, but there are certainly many promises from God that He's going to provide your needs. Right? And that that provision oftentimes is connected very much with our giving. Do you doubt that? How about Proverbs 11.25? Listen, this is a good one. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Well, how does that work? If I give my money away, how do I grow richer? That's a, that doesn't seem to be... I, I was an engineering student. I took a lot of years of math. One minus one equals zero. I mean, if I have a hundred of something and I give away 50, I end up with 50. I have less. This says, if one gives freely, he has a hundred, minus 50 equals 200. That's not good math. But that's what the math of the... That's, that's Solomon's math. One gives freely. See, this is what he observed. You have to understand that these Proverbs are full of the wisdom of a man who observed life. And he said, I see these people and they give freely and yet they're growing all the richer. While another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and he who waters will himself be watered. You see, there's a God factor in this. You give, God makes certain that there's growth here. Proverbs 19.17 Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and He will repay him for his deed. Now, I'm not going to always say that all the repayment is in this world. So if you do this, just simply... You you see, this is a lot of the thing. You know, I I can't even tell you what I feel about that Michael Murdoch guy, but he's... I can remember the young Christian coming across him and talking about sowing this $1,000 seed and breaking the back of poverty. You know the guy I'm talking about? If ever there was a shyster. Brethren, this idea, you see a lot of people give because they're nothing more than greedy. And they give because they want to get rich. But that's, this is not what we see here. We see giving that is, is love motivated. And, and if there's repayment, I would rather take it spiritually. I'd rather take... Truth is, if God wants to reward, I would rather have it be manifestations of Christ to my soul. Deuteronomy 15.10, You shall give to him freely, a poor brother. Your heart shall be grudging 
not be grudging when you give to him, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. There's a blessing promise from God to those who give. Luke 6.38, I've already mentioned it, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. There is a biblical principle for giving. You know what? As a pastor, and I, I think Carlos as a deacon could attest to this too, but I can tell you this, most of the professing Christians that have come through this church that have the greatest amount of financial difficulty, week in, week out, month after month, that have these pitiful stories about their financial situations are typically ones who give virtually nothing. I mean, it goes hand in hand. God sees to it that those that are liberal givers are taken care of. He really does. Proverbs 3, nine. many of you know it. You haven't memorized. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And I'll tell you, just because of the health, wealth, prosperity lies doesn't mean we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is Bible and it's real and it's true and it's promised. And I have every reason to expect that when I give, that God is going to see to it that when I'm in need, my needs are going to be met. Ecclesiastes 5.13, There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. You see, he sees. This is the case. People keep riches and it ends up being to their hurt. 2 Corinthians 9.6, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Very quickly, myth number eight. 10% is God's, 90% is mine. Brethren, I hope you've already seen. God says in Psalm 50, I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. Every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. You know Psalm 24 perhaps. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and those who dwell therein. Brethren, it is His. He told Job, whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Matthew 25, you know the parables. You have the, the parable over in Luke, the parable in Matthew, where you have these servants, a man going on a journey. He called his servants and trusted to them what? His property. Brethren, the scriptures all over talk about us as slaves, as stewards. It's His property. It's been entrusted to us. It's not like my Aunt Peggy. I remember I had this very godless aunt after I was first saved. She's dead now and she knows the truth. She told me, my money is not God's. Any of it. She said 100% of it is mine. You know the biggest proof that it wasn't hers? She doesn't have it anymore. God can take it away from you when He wants to take it. The biggest proof that your money is not your own is how fast we can lose it. Remember what David said, all comes from you and of your own have we given you. You are stewards. And look, when the Master comes, He calls us into account. Right? Right? His master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather what I, where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. It's all his own. And he's going to come and there's going to be an accounting. So, take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. Did you notice that? He's got the authority to take the talent away. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That is the great indicator of ownership, when he has the right to say, give to him, take from him. How about this, myth number nine. So myth number eight, 10% is God's, 90% is mine. Myth number nine, tithing is the standard for Christian giving. Now, and I don't doubt many of you have bought into that myth. I get, we get people here that come to the church all the time and they're convinced tithing is God's standard for giving. It's not. Let me just tell you that right up front. It's not. Look, many like to appeal to Matthew 3.8. Will not, 
well, man robbed God, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? And of course, it mentions tithes there. And so we, people bring that along into the New Testament. And they say, yes, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, they tithe of their anise and their mint and their cumin. And Jesus says, these things ought you to have done. But what I would have you to remember is this. Before that rail, that veil was rent in two, Jesus also observed the Passover. He also told people, lepers that were healed, to go show themselves to the priesthood. He respected the old covenant system. But when you enter out into the New Testament, you find not a hint of tithing ever mentioned. When these apostles went out to the Gentiles who did not have the Old Testament, they never mentioned tithing. Now let me tell you this, tithing, in other words 10%, was not even the standard in the Old Testament. You say, what? That's what we've always been taught. Yeah, by the shysters and by the health, wealth, prosperity guys, and sometimes by just misguided, unbiblical good men. But listen, I'm not going to get into a full deal with tithing right now, but just I wanted to read a, a short little blurb here from John MacArthur. MacArthur says, You pay 10% to the Levites, that's a tithe, to them as they operated in behalf of God in the government. You paid 10% to take care of the national festivals, which there were many, many. Then you paid another 10% every third year, which went to the poor and the widows. So if you broke that down, you were about 23 and a third percent per year. Now, what, was, now what that was, was an income tax system. That was a system of taxation to find the government and its religious activities and its welfare needs. So when people today say we want it to tithe now like they did in the Old Testament, they can't stop at 10%. They've got to give 23.3% to start with. In addition to that, you paid half shekel temple tax every year. In addition to that, if you had a field, you had to harvest the field in a circle and leave the corners open to the poor. It was a profit sharing plan. If you dropped a bale of hay off your wagon on the way to the barn, you had to leave that for the poor. So he's, he estimates you actually gave under the Old Testament system about 25%. Now, if you ever came from the circles that loved Malachi 3 and verse 8, you say, brother, you like to be biblical. Why don't you prove all this from the Old Testament? Because I don't want to do a big study on tithing right now, but just hear me out here. Malachi 3.8 does not say, will man rob a God by not giving tithes? It says, well, for one, the tithes is plural, but two, it says tithes and offerings. You see, the law demanded that you give so much, which according to MacArthur was about 25%. You didn't even get into the free will offerings. That was over and above. And God said, you robbed me, not just with regards to the tithes. You robbed me with regards to the tithes and the contributions or, and the offerings. Those free will offerings. That, and listen, the Gentiles, guys, these guys at Corinth who were Gentiles, they didn't have the Old Testament Scriptures. When Paul came in there, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, he says, I'm going to convince these Corinthians to give. If he had law to appeal to, he would have appealed to it. But you notice, dead silence. What did he appeal to? He appealed to the example of the Macedonians who hearts burning with love. You just couldn't keep them from giving. Guess what else he appealed to? The example of Jesus Christ, who being rich became poor, so he, we were poor would become rich. He used the manna as an example, remember? Nobody had too much, nobody had too little. He talks about God loving a cheerful giver. He talks about this rule of basically, if you sow plentifully and bountifully, you'll reap bountifully, but if you sow sparingly, he told that. He also said, and by your giving, you supply their need. So there's that. That can cheer your soul when you give. You provide people's needs. He also said, if you give, God is going to be thanked. It glorifies Him. He also said, if you give, the people that you give on behalf of are going to feel for you, and they're going to love you, and they're going to appreciate you, and they're going to pray for you. He appeals to all these things. He has, I mean, again and again and again and over and over and over, he appeals to everything that he can think of to appeal, and he does not appeal to tithing. Never to the Gentiles is it appealed to. And so if you've got this mindset that 10%, you say, well, what are you saying? How much should we give? Well, I don't know, but the widow gave everything, and Zacchaeus gave half, and the the early Christians 
We're giving their lands. What's the standard? Brethren, I, I'm not going to be your conscience. But if you come in and you write out a check, $118.23, brethren, that's being pretty legalistic. That, that does not seem like a check that is love-driven or that is a cheerful giver given. It's a check that often... Now, I understand if you take... You know, if you sold something and you got exactly that amount you intended to give it, and so you give it, like, you know, I, the, when the land was sold, you know, there was some of those folks there that didn't exactly give all of it, as they promised they would, but you understand what I'm saying? Don't, don't brethren, you don't want to have your giving be legal. Let it be love-driven, cheerful given. God loves a cheerful giver. So I know I've gone long. The last one here is this. Myth number 10. If only God would provide, we could get the work done. Brethren, God has provided. I'll just mention Hudson Taylor to you. There was a day he was singing. He had like 100 missionaries out there on the field. Funds weren't coming in. One of the guys is watching him and he's over there whistling. And he was whistling uh, Jesus... Um... Oh, there was a song that he really liked and we, we sing it. And maybe it'll come to me. But he's over there whistling. And the guy looks at him and he says, you're whistling. And he said, you've got all these missionaries out there in China Inland Mission. They're out there in the, in, in the field and no money's coming in. And you're whistling like nothing's wrong. He said, I've got a quarter in my pocket and all the promises of God. You know what the fact is? God's given us promises. Do you remember? There was a promise given that they were going to cross the Jordan and go into the land of Canaan where they were going to throw down the walls of Jericho. And you know what? It was in flood season. You say, that's pretty hard to get across the Jordan in flood season. Well, not if God stops the water and does a miracle and heaps up all the water and lets you cross on dry land. Then it's pretty easy to get across. But you notice, God didn't just stop the water when they were like a mile off looking through binoculars and scoping out the horizon. The priests actually had to come and put their feet in the water. Brethren, that's so much like the promises that God has given to us. You see, for us to say, we have to wait to do something that God has called us to do until God has given the, us the provision to do it, that, is that faith? That's sight. That's not living by faith. That's walking by sight. That's saying, I have to see it before we can move forward. I have to see it before we can engage the work of God. That is not trusting the Lord. And so this afternoon, I don't have any intention of making decisions based on what our checkbook says. We never have. That is, we do not ask Carlos to stand up and show us exactly what the giving was every single month and how much is presently in the checkbook ledger in order to now make our decisions. We've never done that. And you know what? Every time we've made increases, despite the past history, God has, you know, I remember the one year, and I've told this story many times, but we were at about 87 maybe months in the history of our church, and I said, Carlos, how many months have we sustained that giving? And he came back and he said, in the whole history of our church, 87 months, that amount has only come in five times. And we agreed to an amount above that. And then for the next 12 months, it came in every single time, 12 months straight. And we, the, brethren, what do, you, what do you attribute that to? Not the arm of the flesh. It's God's promises. If God has promised, we don't need God to provide before the work gets done. We need to be... Look, George Mueller didn't say, well, when I see food, then we'll sit down with the orphans at the breakfast table. You know what he did? He knew the promise. God shall supply all your need. And so he had no food. He had houses full of children. Can God rain down food from heaven on, on a moment's notice to feed hundreds, if not thousands of orphans? They had none. And he sat down and they prayed and thanked the Lord for the breakfast they were about to eat. And wouldn't you know, the baker, God awoke, awoke him in the middle of the night and pressed upon him, Mueller's orphans are hungry. 
And he made all this food and he shows up and right at that time the axle on the milkman's cart broke right outside and he knew that in the time it was going to take to fix that axle the milk was going to go bad so he hauled all these casks of milk there so they had milk and bread and they all had their and look if you think God is any different today than he was back then he is no different Pat Horner told me a story he said that they had nothing in the house they had no food in those early years after he quit his job and he became a pastor they had no food except one can of beans and they had some little children and his wife over there and they were all going to sit down and enjoy this can of beans it was all they had and his wife burned the beans so they sat down at the table and they thanked God and while he was thanking the Lord the knock came at the door and the neighbor lady just felt compelled and brought in bags of groceries folks if you don't think there is a God that cares for his people and is true to his promises brethren we need to look at God's word and ask ourselves this does he tell us to go forth to the nations does he tell us to make disciples Brethren, what he's called us to do, we can go do, and we can trust that the money is going to come in for it. We need to trust him. We need to believe him. It is a myth to think you've got to look at the checkbook before the church of the living God decides what it's going to do. That is a myth. But that is the way the world operates. So anyways, there's ten myths. I hope you all believe they're myths, right? They are. Well, God help us to not trust money, serve money, love money, but to love the ever-living God. And I know I went long, and uh, I hope you'll excuse me for that. Lord, may you give us a right perspective, right heart, right lives. Lord, what I want, what I hope, I long for that day to see men and women who you have allowed me to pastor receive well done, good and faithful servant, and to behold on the faces of my brethren when they behold the immeasurable riches of the inheritance as it's revealed in all that they have in Christ and to realize they never gave too little or they never gave too much, that to see in that moment that they will not fret or dread that they ever had given too much, but only to feel that they should have given all. Lord, I pray that that would be the lot of everyone here, that they would hear that. Well done well spent, well laid up. There is an enormous bounty of treasure that has come before you, gone before you, that you have laid up here in heaven and now receive the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Lord, I long to see that. Make this church giving. Make us like the Macedonians. Lord, give us the same heart. They didn't have anything that came to them naturally. They didn't have anything that came to them natural from the pagan world, from the Gentile world. What those Macedonians were were living expressions of the very heart of Christ pulsing within them. Lord, You did that to them. You made them what they were. And You can make us just the same. If it takes extreme poverty, if it takes the type of affliction they had to go through, then put us through it, Lord, that we may shine like they did that we would have that type of reputation that would ring true and good through the ages. We pray for that in Christ's name. Amen.